All right, so we're going to work on Little House for Thursday, chapters 13 and 14. You will need your um, new vocab sheet for the last two weeks, week three and four, um, and our word will be up the top. And you're going to need a new trifold, week three trifold, that has chapters 13 through 20 on it, chapters 13 through 20. So in our lesson today will be chapters 13 and 14, um, two fun, shorter chapters. One is about finally getting to Laura and Mary getting to go to an Indian camp and see that. And the other one is about an unexpected opportunity that comes their way, um, being in southern Kansas, right above Oklahoma and Texas. Um, the cattle drives from Texas up to Nebraska, um, uh, it, particularly Kearney and Ogallala. Uh, they would drive the beef cattle from Texas, where there were a lot of ranches, up through those states to um, Kearney and Ogallala, Nebraska, and they would be sold and put on trains and shipped back to the eastern part of the United States, particularly to Chicago, um, where they were then turned into meat. So they're going to have an opportunity to get um, some meet that Pa didn't hunt, so it'll be a kind of a fun chapter, and there's a little surprise in that one. So, our word is squall. I need to get a new marker. S-Q-U-A-L-L, -L, squall, that we're going to find in our one of our two chapters. And then we are talking about drawing conclusions, chapter 13 and 14, drawing conclusions. So, if you will remember, that means that we are using all of the different times that things have been um, explained to us in the book to make a decision about someone's character, um, the way they think, and the way they act. So several times throughout this book, we have seen Pa make exchanges where he received an animal or other items as a trade or a reward. Um, in this chapter the first one, um, the Texas Longhorns one, we're going to see that Pa does that again. And so we want to look for and think about why is this the reward or the trade that he makes a good reward for Pa, and why do you think he prefers to do that than to get money? And we'll write about it when we get finished. All right, so our first chapter, 13, starts on... Page 162, Texas Longhorns, and then Indian Camp will be the second one we'll read today. And I have a little something interesting to tell you about that one when we get there. Okay, Texas Longhorns, page 162. One evening, Laura and Pa were sitting on the doorstep. The moon shone over the dark prairie. The winds were still, and softly Pa played his fiddle. He let a last note quiver far, far away until it dissolved in the moonlight. Everything was so beautiful that Laura wanted it to stay so forever, but Pa said it was time for little girls to go to bed. Then Laura heard a strange, low, distant sound. What's that? she said. Pa listened. Cattle, by George, he said, must be the cattle herds going north to Fort Dodge. After she was undressed, Laura stood in her nightgown at the window. The air was very still, not a grass blade rustled, and far away and faint she could hear that sound. It was almost a rumble and almost a song. Is that singing, Pa, she asked. Yes, Pa said. The cowboys are singing the cattle to sleep. Now hop into bed, you little scalawag. Laura thought of cattle lying on the dark ground in the moonlight and of cowboys softly singing lullabies. The next morning, when she ran out of the house, two strange men were sitting on horses by the stable. They were talking to Pa. They were red-brown as Indians, but their eyes were narrow slits between squinting eyelids. They wore flaps of leather over their legs and spurs and wide-brimmed hats. Handkerchiefs were knotted around their necks and pistols were on their hips. 
They said so long to Pa and hi yip to their horses, and they galloped away. Here's a piece of luck, Pa said to Ma. Those men were cowboys. They wanted Pa to help them keep the cattle out of the ravines among the bluffs of the creek bottoms. Pa would not charge them any money, but he told them he would take a piece of beef. How would you like a good piece of beef, Pa asked. So Pa is trading his work for a big piece of beef. Um, and we're supposed to think about how, why that's a good, good reward for Pa. And we've done that. We've seen that he did that with borrowing nails and trading the old horses for the new horses um, trading labor where Mr. Edwards came and built their house and then he helped him build his house and Mr. Scott helped them build their well and, or dig their well and then he helped Mr. Scott dig their well. Um, why is trading this way a good idea and why is a piece of beef a good reward for Pa? So be thinking about that. Oh, Charles, said Ma and her eyes shone. Pa tied his biggest handkerchief around his neck. He showed Laura how he could pull it up over his mouth and nose to keep the dust out. Then he rode Patty west along the Indian Trail till Laura and Mary couldn't see him anymore. All day the hot sun blazed and the hot winds blew and the sound of the cattle herds came nearer. It was the faint mournful sound of cattle lowing. As no at noon dust was blowing along the horizon, Ma said that so many cattle trampled the grasses flat and stirred up dust from the prairie. Pa came riding home at sunset covered with dust. There was dust in his beard and in his hair and on the rims of his eyelids and dust fell off of his clothes. He did not bring any beef because the cattle were not across the creek yet. The cattle went very slowly eating grass as they went. They had to eat enough grass to be fat when they came to the cities where people ate them. Pa did not talk much that night, and he didn't play the fiddle. He went to bed soon after supper. The herds were so near now that Laura could hear them plainly. The mournful lowing sounded over the prairie till the night was dark. Then the cattle were quieter, and the cowboys began to sing. Their songs were not like lullabies. They were high, lonely, wailing songs, almost like the howling of wolves. Laura lay awake, listening to the lonely songs wandering in the night. Farther away, real wolves howled. Sometimes the cattle howl, lowed. Sorry, sometimes the cattle lowed, which is that noise that cattle make when they are like laying in the grouse. Kind of a... Mm, sound um kind of a content sound Moo. but the cowboy songs went on rising and falling and wailing away under the moon when everyone else was asleep laura stole softly to the window and she saw three fires gleaming like red eyes from the dark edge of the land overhead the sky was big and still and full of moonlight the lonely songs seemed to be crying for the moon they made Laura's throat ache. All next day, Laura and Mary watched the west. They could hear the faraway bawling of the cattle. They could see dust blowing. Sometimes they thinly heard a shrill yell. Suddenly, a dozen longhorn cattle burst out of the prairie, not far from the stable. They had come up out of a draw going down into the Keurig bottoms. Their tails stood up and their fierce horns tossed and their feet pounded the ground. A cowboy on a spotted Mustang galloped madly to get in front of them. He waved his big hat and yelled sharp high yells, Hi! Yay, yay, hi! The cattle wheeled, clashing their long horns together. With lifted tails, they galloped, lumbering away. I just made Daisy bark by making that noise. She's downstairs barking at me. I'm sorry. And behind them, the mustake rang and ran and whirled and ran, herding them together. They all went over a rise of ground and down out of sight. Laura ran back and forth, waving her sunbonnet and yelling, hi yi 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 till Ma told her to stop. It was not ladylike to yell like that. Laura wished she could be a cowboy. <laughs> Late that afternoon, three riders came out of the west driving one lone cow. One of the riders was Pa on Patty. 
Slowly they came nearer, and Laura saw that the cow with the cow was a little spotted calf. The cow came lunging and plunging. Two cowboys made, rode well apart in front of her. Two ropes around her long horns were fastened to the cowboy's saddles. When the, cows, when the cow lunged with her horns toward either cowboy, the other cowboy's pony braced its feet and held her. The cow bawled and the little calf bleated thinner bawls. Ma watched from the window while Mary and Laura stood against the house and stared. The cowboys held the cow with their ropes while Pa tied her to the stable. Then they said goodbye to him and rode away. Ma could not believe that Pa had actually brought home a cow. But it really was their own cow. The calf was too small to travel, Pa said, and the cow would be too thin to sell. So the cowboys had given them to Pa. They had also given him the beef, too. A big chunk was tied to his saddle horn. Pa and Ma and Mary and Laura and even baby Carrie laughed for joy. Pa always laughed out loud and his laugh was like great bells ringing. When Ma was pleased, she smiled a gentle smile that made Laura feel warm all over. But now she was laughing because they had a cow. Give me a bucket, Caroline, said Pa. He was going to milk that cow right away. He took the bucket, he pushed back his hat, and he squatted by the cow to milk her. And that cow hunched herself up and kicked Pa flat on his back. He should have known better that that wasn't the way to approach her. Um, Pa jumped up, his face was blazing red, and his eyes snapped blue sparks. Now by the great horn spoon, I'll milk her, he said. He got his axe and he sharpened two stout slabs of oak. He pushed the cow against the stable, and he drove those so slabs deep into the ground beside her. The cow bawled, and the little cow, the little calf squalled. You hear our word there? Think about what they're doing. Pa tied poles firmly to the posts and stuck their ends into the cracks of the stable to make a fence. Now the cow could not move forward or backward or sideways. But the little calf could nudge its way between the mother and the stable. So the baby calf felt safe and stopped bawling. It stood on that side of the cow and drank its supper, and Pa put his hand through the fence and milked from the other side. He got a tin cup almost full of milk. We'll try again in the morning, he said. That poor thing's as wild as a deer. But we'll gentle her. We'll gentle her. The night, the dark was coming on night and day. Nighthawks were chasing insects in the dark air. Bullfrogs were croaking in the creek bottoms. A bird called Whip, Whip, whip a will Who, who, said an owl. Far away the wolves howled and Jack was growling. The wolves are following the herds, Pa said. Tomorrow I'll build a strong high yard for, that, for the cow that wolves can't get into. So they all went into the house with the beef. Pa and Ma and Mary and Laura all agreed to give the milk to baby Carrie. They watched her drink it. The tin cup hit her face, but Laura could see the gulps of milk going down her throat. Gulp by gulp, she swallowed all that good milk. Then she licked the foam from her lip with her red tongue and laughed. It seemed a long time before the cornbread and the sizzling beefsteaks mm, were done. But nothing had ever tasted so good as that tough, juicy beef. And everyone was happy because now there would be milk to drink and perhaps even butter for the cornbread. The lowing of the cattle herds was far away again and the songs of the cowboys were almost too faint to be heard. All, th the, all those cattle were on the other side of the creek bottoms now in Kansas. Tomorrow they would slowly go farther on their long way northward to Fort Dodge where the soldiers were and then from there they would head on further north into nebraska because fort dodge is in is in um kansas okay so we should be thinking about uh the extra special reward that paul got um a cow and a calf and a chunk of beef why would that be better than getting money for working and helping the cowboys but before we answer that question, we're going to go on to the second chapter that's lumped with this. We don't have a vocab word from this chapter, and we don't have 
um, a trifold activity that goes with it. It's just a fun chapter for us to read. And it's called Indian Camp. And this is an odd chapter because um, they don't talk about something that happened in real life. Um, Little House on the Prairie and Little House in the Big Woods, as they are lined up in the book series, are actually in the wrong place. When Laura first decided that she was going to write a book about her memories of being a little girl pioneer, um, she decided to write about the time that she and her family lived in the big woods when she was like four or five years old. And that was the only book she was ever going to write. She just wanted to make sure that the stories that Pa told and those memories of that time were shared with people so they would remember what it was like. So she wrote that book um, and it was terrific and it was well received and she won awards for it. And children wrote her letters and letters and letters and letters begging her for another book. And so she decided that, yeah, she would write more books about her life and they would be autobiographical. And she would even write one book for about her husband and what it was like for him to grow up on a farm in New York State. So she wrote the next book, but then she was faced with a little bit of difficulty because she's like, well, I need to write a book about when we lived on the prairie and what it was like to travel and be a homesteader. And she and her publishers decided that Little House in the Big Woods would always be the first book. And she's like, well, but the stuff in Little House in the Big Woods actually happened after the stuff in Little House on the Prairie. I was younger when we traveled to Kansas. And what I remember of that was told to me by Ma and Pa. And so rather than rewriting or renumbering the series, they decided that they would change the book just a tiny bit. So this is where she did make some alterations. So in real life, when they went to Kansas in this book, Laura would have been about two, two and a half years old. Um, until she was about three and a half years old. So in the book, she looks a lot older. They made her more like seven, which um, would have been when they went to live in uh, Minnesota. She would have been about that age. So here they've made her a little bit better. So there was continuity and it made sense rather than jumping back and forth. The other issue that they had to deal with was when her parents traveled to Kansas, to be homesteaders. Laura was only two or two and a half. And that means that her little sister, baby Carrie, wasn't born yet. And as a matter of fact, when they left little house, the little house in the big woods and Laura is a little two-year-old girl, her ma was pregnant. She was going to have baby Carrie. And can you imagine? sitting on a wagon seat all those months, traveling, having that log fall on top of you while you're helping your husband build your house and you are pregnant with a baby? That's made that even more scary. But in real life, she was. So this chapter, Indian Camp, it's kind of an odd chapter. It's kind of out of place in the book. It did really happen. Laura and Mary got to go see um, an Indian camp where the Indians weren't there anymore. It was an abandoned camp. Um, but they didn't just go with Pa because it was a day where he had nothing to do. That wasn't the case ever. And that's the way it seems in the book. It seems weird. Um, what was really happening was that Ma was giving birth. So in this chapter in real life, Ma gave birth to baby Carrie and Mrs. Scott came and helped her. But it doesn't tell us that in the book because that would make the whole series not flow correctly. So... That is kind of an odd thing, and sometimes authors have to do that to make things work. Uh, her books are still accurate autobi autobiographically, except that, you know, ages are a little different in some spots. So keep that in mind. There's a reason that Pa takes a day off and heads off to show him this Indian camp, and that's because the little girls didn't need to be at home while their mother was having a baby. All right. 
day after day was hotter than the day before. The wind was hot as if it came out of an oven, Ma said. The grass was turning yellow. The whole world was rippling green and gold under the bla bla blazing sky, which would put us at late July, early August, because that's exactly what it feels like here in Nebraska at that time. At noon, the wind died. No birds sang. Everything was so still that Laura could hear the squirrels chattering in the trees down by the creek. Suddenly, black crows flew overhead, cawing their rough, sharp, sharp caws. Then everything was still again. Ma said that this was midsummer. Pa wondered where the Indians had gone. He said they had left their little camp on the prairie. And one day he asked Laura and Mary if they would like to see that camp. Laura jumped up and down and clapped her hands, but Ma objected. It is so far, Charles, he said, and in this heat? Pa's eye, blue eyes twinkled. This heat doesn't hurt the Indians and it won't hurt us, he said. Come on, girls. Oh, please, can't Jack come too, Laura begged. Pa had taken his gun, but he looked at Laura and he looked at Jack. Then he looked at Ma and he put the gun up on its pegs again. All right, Laura, he said, I'll take Jack, Caroline, and leave you the gun. Jack jumped around them, wagging his stump of a tail. As soon as he saw which way they were going, he set off, trotting ahead. Pa came next and behind them came Mary and then Laura. Mary kept her sunbonnet on, but Laura let hers dangle down her back. The ground was hot under their bare feet. The sunshine pierced through their faded dresses and tingled on their arms and backs. The air was really as hot as the air in an oven, and it smelled faintly like baking bread. Pa said the smell came from all the grass seeds parching in the heat, which in late July, early August, it's not unusual for it to be 100, 101, 102. So it probably was. They went farther and farther into the vast prairie. Laura felt smaller and smaller. Even Pa did not seem as big as he really was. At last, they went down into the little hollow where the Indians had camped. Jack started up a big rabbit. Then it bounded out of the grass. Laura jumped. Pa said quickly, let him go, Jack. We have meat enough. So Jack sat down and watched the big rabbit go bounding away down the the hollow. Laura and Mary looked around them. They stayed close to Pa. Low bushes grew on the sides of the hollow. Buck brush with sprays of berries faintly pink and sumac holding up the green cones but showing here and there a bright red leaf. The goldenrod's plumes were mo turning gray and the ox-eyed daisy's yellow petals hung down from the crown centers. All this was hidden in the secret little hollows. From the house, Laura had seen nothing but grasses, and now from this hollow, she could not see the house. The prairie seemed to be level, but it wasn't level. Laura asked Pa if there were lots of hollows on the prairie like this one, and he said there were. Are Indians in them? She almost whispered. He said he didn't know. There might be. She held tight to his hand, and Mary held to his other hand, and he looked at the Indian camp. There were ashes where Indian campfires had been. There were holes in the ground where tent poles had been driven. Bones were scattered, scattered where Indian dogs had gnawed them. All along the sides of the hollow, Indian ponies had bitten the grasses short. Tracks of big moccasins and smaller moccasins were everywhere, and tracks of little bare toes. And over these tracks were tracks of rabbits and tracks of birds and wolves' tracks. Pa read the tracks for Mary and Laura. He showed them tracks of two middle-sized moccasins by the edge of a campfire's ashes. An Indian woman had squatted there. She wore a leather skirt with fringes. The tiny marks of the fringe were in the dust. The track of her toes inside the moccasins was deeper than the track of her heels because she had leaned forward to stir something cooking in a pot on the fire. And if you look carefully, you can see that in the back, right next to that burned out spot. Then Pa picked up a smoke blackened fork stick. And he said that the pot had hung from a stick laid across the top of two upright forked sticks. He showed Mary and Laura the ashes where the forked sticks had been driven into the ground. Then he told them to look at the bones around the camp 
campfire and tell him what had cooked in that pot. They looked and they said, rabbit. That was right. The bones were rabbit's bones. Suddenly, Laura shouted, look, look. Something bright blue glittered in the dust. She picked it up and it was a beautiful blue bead. Laura shouted with joy. Then Mary saw a red bead, and Laura saw a green one, and they forgot everything but beads. Pa helped them look. They found white beads and brown beads and more and more red and blue beads. All that afternoon, they hunted for beads in the dust of the Indian camp. Now and then, Pa walked up to the edge of the hollow and looked toward home. Then he came back and helped to hunt for more beads. They looked all the ground over carefully. When they couldn't find any more, it was almost sunset. Laura had a handful of beads and so did Mary. Pa tied them carefully on his handkerchief. Laura's beads in one corner and Mary's in another corner. He put the handkerchief in his pocket and they started home. The sun was low behind their backs when they came out of the hollow. Home was small and very far away and Pa did not have his gun. Pa walked so swiftly that Laura could hardly keep up. She trotted as fast as she could, but the sun sang faster, sank faster. Home seemed farther and farther away. The prairie seemed larger, and a wind ran over it, whispering something frightening. All the grasses shook as if they were scared. When Pa turned around and his blue eyes twinkled at Laura, he said, Getting tired, little lap pipe? It's a long way for little legs. He picked her up, big girl that she was, and he settled her safe against his shoulder. He took Mary by the hand, and so they all came home together. Supper was cooking in the fire. Ma was settling, setting the table, and baby Carrie played with little pieces of wood on the floor. Pa, crossed, pa, pa tossed the handkerchief to Ma. I'm later than I met, Caroline, he said, but look at what the girls found. He took the milk bucket and went quickly to bring Pat and Patty from their picket lines and to milk the cow. Ma untied the handkerchief and exclaimed at what she found. The beads were even prettier than they had been in the Indian camp. Laura stirred her beads with her finger and watched them sparkle and shine. These are mine, she said. Then Mary said, oh, Carrie can have mine. Ma waited to hear what Laura would say. Laura didn't want to say anything. She wanted to keep those pretty beads. Her chest felt all hot inside, and she wished with all her might that Mary wouldn't always be such a good little girl. But she couldn't let Mary be better than she was. So she said slowly, Carrie can have mine too. That's my unselfish good little girl, said Ma. She poured Mary's beads into Mary's hands and Laura's into Laura's hands, and she... And she said she would give them a thread to string them on. The beads would make a pretty necklace for Carrie to wear around her neck. Mary and Laura were sat side by side on the bed. And they strung those pretty beads on the thread that Ma gave them. Each wet her end of the thread in her mouth and twisted it tightly. Then Mary put her end of the thread through the small hole in each of the beads. And Laura put her end through her beads one by one. They didn't say anything. Perhaps Mary felt sweet and good inside, but Laura didn't. When she looked at Mary, she wanted to slap her, so she dared not look at Mary again. The beads made a beautiful string. Carrie dropped her hand, slapped her hands and laughed when she saw it. Then Ma tied it around Carrie's little neck and it glittered there. Laura felt a little bit better. After all, her beads were not enough beads to make a whole string, and neither were Mary's. But together, they made a whole string of beads for Carrie. When Carrie felt the beads on her neck, she grabbed at them. She was so little that she did not know any better than to break that string. So Ma untied it, and she put the beads away until Carrie would be old enough to wear them. And... Often after that, Laura thought of those pretty beads, and she was still naughty enough to want her beads for herself. But it had been a wonderful day. She could always think about that long walk across the prairie and about all that they had seen in the Indian camp. Okay, before we do our vocab and our um, trifold, I'm going to show you... Um, 
the beads. Not the exact beads, but what those pencil beads look like. There they are. Because in the pictures, in the chapter, um, in order for you to be able to see them, they make them really big. They make them look like they're about this big and that they are almost wooden beads, but they're not. The beads that are found on Indians' uh, things were little tiny beads like this. The, those little beads, can you see those? So the little ones in here. Um, so when you go to museums and you see the beads that are on the moccasins and on the front of the fancy dresses, there's a little tiny glass beads. And I have some in a box there to show you. Um, they, they're, they're much smaller than the ones in there. So you can tell that a handful of those for each of the girls would definitely not have been enough to make a string of necklace. Um, but I know that they made them larger so you could see them a little bit better, uh, which always confuses people. They're really super, super teeny, tiny little beads. And so stringing those must have been quite something, especially to make some of those really, really, really intricate pictures that they made on the top of moccasins so that would be kind of some fun interesting things that happened in these chapters um, our next chapter is a much longer one it goes all by itself that we're going to read tomorrow uh, fever and a goo and we hear about that sickness that we've learned about called malaria um, we were looking for the word squall and in the first chapter, at the very end, it talked about how the baby calf was squalling next to the mother, and the mother was making a bawling noise. Um, so when a cow makes a bawling noise, it's that moo sound that they make, but they make it in a way that makes it sound like they're crying. Moo! Moo! Like that. And so the baby was making a smaller, softer sound, so they call that squalling or squall. So squall is a soft crying sound made by a calf. So on our new vocabulary sheet, underneath the word squall or on the back side, however you've been doing it, write a soft crying sound made by a calf. All right, and if you need to pause or let me take a little bit longer to do that, you write it down, you can. I'm gonna erase it and we're gonna move on to our trifold. So, we were supposed to think about how Pa traded his work for a reward, in this case, um, and why it was a good reward for Pa, and why do you think Pa preferred it to money? So, we know that he traded his work um, originally just for a piece of beef, but it wound up to be actually for a whole cow and a calf and a piece of beef. So why would that be um, a good reward for Pawn? Why would he take that over money? So we would discuss at length in our classroom, and I would ask you things like, well, how did you buy things in the pioneer days? Um, and most people, most of you guys know from living in Nebraska and knowing a lot about Nebraska history, uh, even as good third graders, that they traded stuff. And so they didn't have a lot of money available. They didn't carry bills and coins. There were, they did have those in the United States at the time, but um, they weren't used a lot unless you lived in big cities. So it would be more common for the pioneers to trade things. I'm sorry, that light just keeps getting in your eyes um, for other things. So Pa traded horses for new horses. 
and he's talked a couple times about saving up his furs of the animals that he hunts. He dries them out and he puts them in piles and he's I think he's going to trade those for things when he goes to independence. Those furs were then sold and made into things that were sold to people in the city. So he would prefer a cow and a calf because it would be more useful to him than money would be out there on the prairie. He would save it and possibly use it. But at this particular moment, having a cow and milk and a calf and uh, that you could have butter and milk and to get some beef for your family to eat in this very moment right now would have been the most important thing to him. So it, he would take it over money because the cow and the beef would be more useful than money at that time because the cow and the beef would be more useful than money at that time. They wouldn't have gotten as much use out of the money as they did that cow in particular. All right, I'm going to pull it back a little bit. I'm sorry. And lift it up and down and up. And then if you need to stop it so you can continue to copy it down, go ahead. All right, that is it for chapter 13 and 14. Tomorrow, uh, or on, yeah, tomorrow on Friday, we're going to read chapter 15. We're also going to do a close read. We haven't done one of those in a while. And we're going to do a few of those. You have about four or five in a pile that we're going to start putting in with our uh, chapters. Usually when we only do one little house chapter, I'm going to throw in a close read just so we keep our skills sharp for reading nonfiction. All right, see you next time.